Last Sunday, Barry had another crazy questions day, and uh, in it he mentioned Israel's cycles of apostasy, and he used the example of one of uh, Israel's judges, Jephthah, and Jephthah lived about 3,000 years ago. That's a significant space of time. And he used a couple of scriptures from Judges 17, 6, and 21, 25. It's repeated the same statement. In those days, Israel had no king, and all the people did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. And that got me thinking, and I thought, and I asked myself, are people really that different in 3,000 years? Have they really changed? Have nations really changed that much in 3,000 years? And Patricia and I have been studying Isaiah for the last, during the month of June, and several passages from Isaiah have been rolling around in my head. And the cycles of apostasy are part of what Isaiah is dealing with as well, because Israel was in an apostate state. Now, for there to be apostasy, you first have to start out as following God, because apostasy means falling away from God. The concept of cycles of apostasy refers to a series of events that recur regularly. And they lead back to a starting point. So the starting point is belief in God. So in biblical history, the Israelites experienced cycles of apostasy when they would turn away from God and face the consequences of turning away from God and then repent and return to God repeatedly. The key elements of that cycle, apostasy, is a turning away from the truth, often marked by disobedience and idolatry. And the consequences are usually God's discipline and punishment. And it can include military defeat, it can include slavery, or other forms of suffering. The next step in that little parade is repentance, where the Israelites would cry out to God for help, and God would take pity on them, appointing judges or leaders to rescue them. And then God would deliver them. And he'd deliver them from their enemies to restore them to a place of blessing and prosperity. The examples of the uh, cycles of apostasy are, as Barry said, in the book of Judges, when the Israelites would turn away from God, face consequences, and then repent, and then return to God. And the cycle repeated itself multiple times. It's like they didn't learn anything from the first several. They just kept doing it over and over again. The same, the same thing happened to each successive generation experiencing the same pattern. And the book of 1 Samuel also describes the cycles of apostasy, where people would turn away from God and face the consequences and then repent. The implications of those cycles of apostasy highlight the importance of obedience and faithfulness to God. And when the Israelites turned away, they suffered those consequences. The cycles also demonstrate that God is patient, that God is merciful, and despite their repeated failures, God continued to take pity on them and deliver them from their enemies. And the cycles of apostasy deserve, serve as a warning to future generations, including us, emphasizing the need to learn from the past and avoid repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. Now, is Isaiah's call to prophecy. Isaiah was a prophet in Israel about 742 B.C. And he was a prophet about the time that Assyria began to grow and expand in, into the West. And that expansion threatened Israel. And Isaiah said that this was a warning to God's people that God was about to punish them because they stopped listening to him, they'd stopped following him, and they stopped obeying him. He detailed that apostasy, and Isaiah was probably fairly well off because he had uh, an end to the uh, royal court, and he prophesied to the king repeatedly, and successive kings, not just one king. He lasted through the reigns of about three or four different kings. And one of the things that stuck out in my mind is this passage from Isaiah 5.20. Whatever, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. You think that applies today? I do. 
Here's a prophet just speaking to the Jews 700 years before Christ, or approximately 3,000 years ago, and he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Substitute light for darkness and darkness for light, sweetness for bitter and bitter is sweet. And Isaiah describes the sins of the Jewish people. And he, he describes this as a sin that ultimately led to the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 720 BC, and later on the destruction of the southern kingdom, Judah, by the Babylonian Empire in 586 BC. Now this was not the only thing mentioned in the passage. If we continued reading, we would discover that these things were serious enough, serious enough but in verse 20, Isaiah describes a level of sinfulness that the nation had sunk to. It's a new level of sinfulness. They are now not just disobeying God, they are so sinful that they are promoting what is evil and restricting and labeling what has traditionally been good as being evil. They turned everything around. They took God's moral law and they turned it upside down. They said, what is wrong is right, and what is right is now wrong. And Isaiah was telling them that he had completely reversed the moral order. It wasn't enough that they just failed to obey God's command. People have always failed to obey God's commands. We still fail to obey God's commands. There's nothing new about that. What was new was the attempt to change the order so that sinfulness was now considered acceptable. It was no longer sinful. Holiness, faith, and obedience were supposed to be rejected. And Isaiah was warning Israel that once they headed down this road, the only result would be their destruction. Because if they had completely rejected God's moral order and created one of their own, he would no longer protect them. He would no longer help them. He would no longer rescue them until they repented. Trying, to trying and failing to obey God's commands had always left them weak, depending on God's mercy and strength for life and salvation. And of course, that was acceptable to God. He had always offered mercy to his people because he knew that they were weak. Trying to do what was good and right and failing to do it was within the norms. But changing the moral order was something new, and making up their own laws and their own moral framework would, as history shows and did, end in their complete destruction of their nation. Now, we don't call evil good and good evil anymore. We have subtler ways of de deconstructing the moral order set by God. We say things like, love is love. We say things like, every lifestyle deserves respect. Or we say things like, we must guarantee everyone's rights and all lifestyles should be accepted and defended. We talk about gender equality in marriage. We say that we are defending a woman's right to choose. I see newspapers and magazine articles. Not only are these terms legitimate, love does, love does matter and we must respect everybody and laws are often guaranteeing this idea. Those are legitimate things. But the terms have been hijacked by godless ideologies and ideologues who use them to create a moral order in our day that would have been unrecognizable even 20 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. Even our language is being changed and misinter and reinterpreted. Here's a quote. I don't know if I've got that one. Oops, hit the wrong button. You can start laughing now. <laughs> Even our language is being corrupted. A couple of weeks ago, a, a newspaper article in the Courtney record said, and this is a quote, but truth, unlike facts, is subjective 
And to truly understand a subject or a situation, it takes an open mind and some thought. I don't know about you, but the dictionary meaning of truth is this, conformity to fact or actuality. It's not something that's subjective or open to interpretation. Truth is truth. It's ultimate. It is true or it's not true. There is nothing untrue about it. And that is a change that not is only happening with words like truth, but is happening by words like gender. Because gender always used to mean man or male or female. One, two sexes. Now we have multiple sexes. God knows how many they're going to come up with. I see some YouTube things going on where people are claiming to be trisexual. I don't know even what that is. How can you wrap your head around a concept like that? So let's look at the key elements, uh, the key elements of this uh, apostasy. Turning away is marked from truth by disobedience and idolatry. And we, we have in our country so many things going on. The consequences are that God's discipline and with and when we repent, we will turn around. So what state is Canada in? I think we probably know, but I want to detail some of the things that are going on. We look at pride parades in public. We had one in Courtney. It wasn't as bad as the one in, in Toronto or New York. But in those, some of those parades, we have people, grown men, parading around naked, naked in front of children and flaunting their sexuality, flaunting all kinds of things that ought not to be seen in public. Some U.S. states are legalizing or considering legalizing mar three marriages of throuples. You know what a throuple is? No. That's like three people getting married, two of one and one of the other, or three of the same. It doesn't matter anymore. Drag queen story time for children and toddlers in the library. Or you got people, men dressing up in women's clothing. And that's supposed to be inclusive. You have pornography accessible with a few mouse clicks or shelved in a school library under the guise of inclusiveness and education. You have drug and alcohol use allowed in public places. And those drugs are supplied by our government. Isn't that special? We, our, our government is now the biggest drug pusher in Canada. And it's legal. Media and entertainment approving and supporting all of the above. Everything. That's what's happening in our country. Disregard for the sanctity of life. We have maids the killing of the elderly and the infirm, and they're now deciding that they can kill the depressed and the mentally ill as well. Abortion, killing preborn infants, enabling and perpetuating addiction by supplying addicts with free drugs instead of spending the money, instead of it's spending the money on drugs, spending money on recovery programs. What sense does that make? I saw it recently Pierre Polyev said he was going to shut down the, the uh, safe, safe injection sites. And CBC immediately got on the bandwagon and said, oh, he's just so, he's, that's just so horribly wrong and it's just a terrible thing and it's disgusting. I think it's the appropriate thing myself. Gender ideology, proclaiming that sex and gender are two different things, proclaiming that there are multiple genders, and, and on top of that, requiring that everybody ex else, so else accept this. Threatening imprisonment for people who attempt to counsel those suffering from body dysmorphia. I don't know about you, but I know that 80% of kids who suffer from being confused about their gender as they're growing up, which is sort of a normal thing for many children, grow out of it. It's not something that they're stuck with, but you know what? Now we've got people say, oh, you think you're a girl? Well, let's just start to cut and snip and we'll take some bits off and guess what? You'll be a woman. No, you won't. You'll just be neutered. Same with girls getting hormone injections to stop puberty. 
transgenderism, neutering and maiming children before they reach maturity with, with surgery and hormone injections. Everybody for the last several 50 years or so has been talking about a population explosion and how the world is becoming overpopulated. That's a lie. Most nations are not producing enough children to replace their population. That is, 80% of the world is now going to face a shrinking population, a population collapse. In Japan, they have less than one child per couple. Japan is, the government of Japan is encouraging their children to have sex just so they'll have enough kids to replace the population. And that is not just in Japan, that is a worldwide phenomenon. China, even India, is facing that kind of problem. Add to that, neutering the children that we already have. Where are we going? Governmental corruption. We have a defense minister, who, who, a former defense minister, who is now facing problems because he apparently told the special forces, the Canadian special forces in Afghanistan, not to pick up the people who were waiting to be evacuated that were A, Canadian citizens, and B, Afghanis who helped Canada but sent them off on a wild goose chase to pick up some other people instead. And the reason he did that was because people contributed to his campaign fund and asked him to do that. And he said, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't order them. I just said they should. <laughs> What's the difference? Again, we have the reinterpretation of language. We have the courts releasing a man who purposely ran over people intending to harm them or kill them versus being Im imprisoning protesters who committed no actual crime. We have jailing of a street preacher in Calgary who was preaching the gospel outside one of these libraries where the drag queens were having their story time. We have a pastor who was imprisoned for holding meetings during the pandemic while the big box stores were still open, while the liquor stores were still open, while the cannabis stores were still open. We have another thing that goes on, and I just want to use from Isaiah 5, 8, and that stuck with me um, the last Friday that we were at prayer time, that, that verse. What sorrow for you who buy house after house, field after field, until everyone is evicted and you live alone in the land. Think about that for a second. The Emerson family in the United States owns 2,330,000 acres. My buddy, Bill Gates, is buying up farmland. Emerson's just got timber and various other things. But Bill Gates is buying up farmland, and he owns almost 269,000 acres, but he hasn't stopped yet. I got a question for Bill. What do you know about farming? Have you ever planted a crop? Extravagant hedonism. Now, this is a good one, Steve. I want you to pay attention to this. We have here a picture of a little super yacht. This is a small one. It's, this is for you. It's, a, it's 140 meters long. It'll accommodate 12 guests. But this one is tiny compared to the others. The biggest super yacht is 180 meters long. I can't give you the displacement tonnage, but it's 180 meters. Guess what it's used for? Day trips to this guy's favorite diving spot. It has a crew of 70. It is about 40 meters longer than Canada's largest naval vessel. It's nuts. Isaiah's words. Oops, yeah, there we go. From 27,000, 2,700, 600, 2,700 years ago, capture the essence of national apostasy. But look what's happening to our nation. Canada was founded as a Christian nation.
The phrase, he shall have dominion from sea to sea, from Psalm 72.8, is an integral part of Canadian national identity, symbolizing Canada's vast expanse and a commitment to be a nation under God. It has been used in various contexts. It's on the coat of arms, of Canadian coat of arms. It's on government documents. It's on national symbols. Now, have a look at this. In June 3rd, 2022, Justin Trudeau met with Pastor Steve Long, a Canadian Baptist minister, and Steve said, Trudeau told him, evangelical Christians are the worst part of Canadian society. That's not the first time he said it. He told John Arnott the same thing. And he has consistently imported people from Muslim countries who are Muslim and ignored the plight of Christians in Muslim countries where they are being persecuted and killed. Justin has consistently penalized those who believe in Christ, denying federal funding to students for summer jobs unless if they are Christians and they will not support abortion. He denies that support to Christian faith groups. They've tried to get, oh, it just makes me crazy. What are the consequences though? What can a nation expect when the nation says that dark is light and light is dark and bitter is sweet and sweet is good? Is Canada apostate? Statistics Canada in 2021 census note reported that 53% of Canadians identified as Christians. That includes all those Christians who are in churches that are apostate, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> According to the search results of provinces, get this, what the lowest percentage of Christians are British Columbia. Hooray for us. The Yukon's at 35%. Even the Yukon's better than we are. The proportion of Muslim Sikhs and Hindus has more than doubled in the same time. 4.29% of the population were Muslims because we imported them. Um, up from 2% more Hindus and Sikhs. You can see the figures. I want to tell you about Brampton, Ontario. In Brampton, Ontario right now is one of the bigger Hindu temples in Canada. And they are right now erecting a 55-foot-tall statue of the god Hanuman, a god with a monkey face and a human body and a big club. It's 55 feet tall in Brampton, Ontario. I remember Barry's preaching about idolatry and the, the, the resurgence of the old gods. The consequences, the consequences of apostasy are God's discipline, including military defeat, slavery, forms of suffering. But there is good news. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive them. I will forgive their sins and restore their land. I don't want to say that Canada is facing God's judgment. I don't want to say it. But is it, it's almost an inescapable conclusion. Some of the things that have been happening to us might be a wake-up call. I'm not saying they are. I'm not saying they aren't. They just might be. Do we need to face military defeat or end up in slavery? before we listen, before we turn around and seek his face. Right now, we're looking, a lot of people are, you know, I've, I've seen the, the events that are going on, the political events that are going on, and 
Pierre Polyevre is becoming very popular. They are way far and ahead of the liberals right now. And I pray that, that what we get is a good government, regardless of who's leading it. But is politics a solution? The cycles of apostasy in scripture serve as a warning, emphasizing the need for nations to change. People's hearts must change. You can't change a nation by trying to change a nation. Even if godly leaders are put in place, ungodly citizens will remove them because we vote. They won't tolerate it. And right now, there are all kinds of people saying, oh, this, you know, a good example was the one I did about Pierre Polyev saying he's going to gonna shut down safe injection sites. Well, there's a lot of people saying, oh, no, this is so terribly wrong. It's horrible. It's a travesty. It's, it's all kinds of things. Look at that. That is what will happen. Until the whole nation turns around, until we repent of our sins, until we get it together, as everybody's been saying this morning, we're going to end up in the same mess again. And I've seen that other nations like Britain and, and various other nations have gone through cycles of apostasy. You'll have an apostate nation for a while, and then God will raise up a uh, uh, an evangelist or a leader and the nation will return to God and then several years down the line it will gradually slide back into this morass of immorality and debauchery and then they will have another revival and then we'll go through it all again. Canada is a young nation. We have not experienced what some of the older nations have. Despite 3,000 years of passing, people are still people and nations are still nations. And unless we return to God as a nation, we're in deep trouble. Unless hearts are transformed by the power of the gospel, people will continue to do what is right in their own eyes. And Jeremiah 7, 9 and 10 says, the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all the hearts and examine the secret motives. And I will give people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. We like to use the verse 9. We like to skip over verse 10. So what do we do about it? If we've learned anything from the Old Testament and Isaiah, it's that the more things change, the more they stay the same. There is nothing new under the sun, as Solomon says. So we don't need to focus on what's going on in the world. That's not our focus. Our focus is there. Our focus is on Jesus. Our focus is on heaven. Our focus is on doing what is right. I used to have an old friend when I first became a new Christian, and his big thing was prophesying when the end was going to come and what was happening. I don't care when the end has come. i got a spoiler alert for everybody. God wins. Amen. We're all going to heaven. The question is, how many are we taking with us? God is still merciful and faithful, even if we're not. So we need to stop worrying about the conditions of the world and stop moaning about the conditions of the world just like I just did. <laughs> we need faith in Jesus. Faith and not fear is what the world needs. Faith and not fear is what the church needs. And our job is not to fix what's out there in the world. Our job is to call people out of that world and into the world to come. Amen. That is our job. It doesn't matter what everybody says. It doesn't matter if we're persecuted. In fact, we are blessed if we are reviled and ridiculed for the, for the name of Jesus. We are blessed if people call us bigots. We are blessed if we give the word out. 
Our job, as I said, is to prepare people for the world to come, and we have the only thing that can bring about a change of heart. We have the only thing, and that is the gospel. Jesus is the only answer to the predicament. Jesus has always been the only answer to the predicament, and it is still the same 3,000 years later, and if Jesus tarries longer, it will still be the same thing 3,000 years from now. Repentance and turning to God is the only way to prevent disaster and calamity, and we've had enough disaster and calamity already. I would like it to change. How about you? Amen. And as Paul said in his last sermon, I'm done now. 